Good morning, good morning. To crucify the flesh. To crucify the flesh. Magnify the Holy Spirit. Magnify the Holy Spirit. And glorify oh, God. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Magnify the Holy Spirit. Magnify Having some problems with my technical Having some technical difficulties. Come on and walk with me on this journey as we study the Word of God together. Welcome, welcome, hallelujah, to a journey into wholeness, cathedral, worldwide ministries, where the flesh is crucified, the Holy Spirit is magnified, and God is glorified, and we give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, I believe I got that light in my face too much, it's bothering my eyes, give me a minute, hallelujah. Magnify the Holy Spirit. Magnif oh, what happened? What happened? Glory. <laughs> Satan, you a lie. The truth is not in you. We had an awesome time at the uh, Women's Empowerment Faith Zone Ministries. And I tell you, it's been a busy week for me. Weekend. And, uh, Woo, Jesus. Help me, Lord, this morning. To God be the glory. You are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Come on in. Come on in for the ones who missed it. The ones told me they were coming. <laughs> you missed a glorious time. It was awesome. Bunch of women that wanted to get a word from the Lord. And just the unity. Loving on one another. Encouraging one another. Praying for one another. It was awesome. Magnify the Holy Spirit. And glorify God. Come on and walk with me on this journey as we study the word of God together. Get your Bibles. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Get your Bibles. Get your Bibles.
I'm seeing that they have some up uh, on my page of the um, women's empowerment. It was awesome. I tell you, the Lord took me a whole different, well, not a whole different way, but somewhat a different way uh, where I shared my testimony all the way back from the ones who have gotten the first book. And I've had people to tell me, uh, Charlene or Pastor Charlene, I had to put it down because it was just too much, too painful. But you know what? Sometimes you have to share because you have to let people know that no matter what, that God, I hope my um, internet is not slow. I don't know what's going on with it. I'm going to have to call. But I shared that and didn't have any intentions on sharing that at all. <laughs> But God, he knows what the people need. Amen. He knows. So I, I'm just so grateful. And like I said, I just noticed, that's what I was looking at, that they have some of it up on the uh, online, on my page. Um, I usually come from my personal page, but I do have a ministry page. But most of the people seem to come to this page, but they're starting to come to the other page. But I've been on this one so long, but... I might just change up and go ahead and go to a journey into wholeness page. But anyway, the word is the word, regardless of whatever page. But you missed a dynamic service, women's en en enrichment. I tell you, uh, it was a choir from out of town down in Raleigh that came. And I was just like, oh, my God. The men were singing, um, well, it was some men in the choir, and they were singing a worship song, and he got so emotional, and it touched my heart, because you, when you see men, you know, get emotional like that, you know, they have a relationship with God, and it's just awesome, and you know, we say, well, we got to be careful with that. Yes, we do, because there's a whole lot of spirits coming out here this day and time, but God, God is the deliverer. He can deliver oh, and set free, hallelujah, like no other. So I believe God, but it was awesome. And I mean, uh, it was powerful for the ones that didn't show. But, you know, I just thank God because I like supporting those women's enrichments and uh, I have been talking about doing one for September, but not necessarily women, one for um, men and women. And I've done them many times, but I was thinking about waiting to next year. But someone came to me and was saying, are you still going to do your women's, uh, uh, not women's, men's and women's conference? Before I got sick, I was doing doing them every year. as well as the retreat. <clears throat> so it's a lot coming back. You're going to be surprised. I'm telling you, I am excited because I have been praying about it. And I got a call uh, last week from my videographer that used to work with me. And he had gone through some things. And, and then I had gone through. And so we were working together. But at that time, we were traveling to different churches and we had a show called Matters of the Heart, and I have some of those old clips, and it's on my website, but uh, we're going to bring that back. We, we're working on it. I, I don't want to speak too soon because I like to meet with people first, but he did give me a call and uh, said that we he wanted to talk about some things, So because you know, God gives me creative ideas and they, you know, workshops and um, different things to help people. And, you know, you can't do it all by yourself. So I'm believing God. I'm believing God, you know, that he will bring the people that's supposed to be a part of a journey into wholeness. But it's a worldwide ministry. So sometimes, you know, I do travel. So I'm grateful to God for what he's doing. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pray and we're going to get in the word. I hope you have your Bibles and you can go ahead and turn to 2 uh, Corinthians. Uh, I'm coming from, I believe, chapter 6. But we're going to go ahead and pray first. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes, uh, the scripture reference is 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 14. And we thank God for Sister Patricia Marsh and Stephanie uh, T Tompkins Harris. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. And the ones on the line, we give God all the glory, honor, and praise. You know, uh, I believe that teaching is so important so we can get clarity, understanding, get our Bibles out, get our application study Bible out. And you'll be surprised how much you learn about God and Jesus Christ walking this earth. That's why we've been studying the New Testament and uh, the four Gospels, because we, we're getting to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and how he walked the earth and is vital. Because, you know, the things that's, come, that's happening in this world now, you know, we want to have such a solid relationship with God to where it won't even affect us. You know, I mean, we're going to feel it in the natural, but we know that God is in control. We know without a shadow of a doubt in our inner being, in our souls, in our spirits, that he is in control. I want the people that listen to me day after day or every week uh, to know that and to get it rooted and grounded in their spirit, man, to no matter. But see, it's up to you because God, he said he wants you to come freely to the throne of grace. So we have to make a conscious decision that we want to be more like Christ. And in order to be more like Christ, we have to study to show thyself approved. Second Timothy 2.15. You can check it. We be, so we'll be able to rightly divide the, the truth, the word of truth. So um, it's up to us because it's time out because there's so many false prophets didn't rise. Politics. I mean, I don't get too much in politics because I believe in, in uh, getting up here and doing what I do, what God has called me to do, not what I want to do, but what God has called me to do. And. So we got to be watchful. We got to continuously pray and stay in the word of God and be more like Christ. Amen. And the only way we can be more like Christ is to study, to show thyself approved. We workmen for God that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. I thank you for another opportunity to study your word with your people. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, Father, for waking us up this morning one more time. Someone didn't wake up this morning, but God, you gave us another day. So this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice uh, in it no matter what's going on around us. We know that you are in control. You give life and you, you take it away, but really you don't take it away. Those people, they died in you. They just sleeping. All of them really sleeping until the day of judgment. Some people don't believe that, but father, we thank you. We ask God that you look over Patricia Marsh's family as they lost their dear auntie and someone lost their grandmother and their sister and auntie and you know God we pray God you tell us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord so Lord I pray that you will comfort the ones that were left here comfort their heart because you're the greatest comforter Lord I pray for anyone that's going through financially I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you will let them know that you are their provider that no matter what they go through in this situation, you show them just how much you love them and how much you will provide for them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Brother uh, Theodore Washington, bless you. Bless you for being on this morning. Thomas Dicker, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you on. Um, so you didn't, you didn't finish your overseas uh, teaching for the morning. You know, he so, you know, I got to, well, it can't be like nobody else, but he blessed. <laughs> I'm going to pick at you. You don't be on as much, so I got to pick at you. But I wish you could have been at that women's uh, retreat. You know, it was a women's uh, empowerment. Lord, I keep saying retreat. And it was awesome. Had some men in them in that choir, and they were just praising God and tears coming out of their eyes. And I just was telling the people before you got on that the men just loving the Lord, in love with Jesus. That was right up my alley. <laughs> in love, being in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. So the title of my message this morning. The Bible's perspective about being unequally yoked. The Bible's perspective about being unequally yoked. The question that comes to mind is, what do you think the Bible is saying when it talks about being unequally yoked? First, what is a yoke? Let's look at it in the natural. So a yoke is a wooden bar that joins two oxen oxen to each other and, and and to burden uh 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 and to the burden that pull that pull an unequally yoked team has one stronger ox and one weaker or uh, one taller and one shorter listen to me so you'll get it the weaker are the shorter ox will walk more slowly than the taller, stronger one, causing the load to go around in circles. When oxen are unequally yoked, hallelujah, they cannot perform the task set before them. Instead of working together, they are at odds with one another. The scripture Reference this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And it reads as thus. It says, do not be unequally uh, bound together with unbelievers. Meaning, beloved, do not make mismatch alliances, allegiance, no alliances with them. Inconsistent with your faith. Mm -hmm. We can stop there right there if we want to. Mm -hmm. For what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship can light with have with darkness? You say, Pastor, well, you know, Jesus, he sat with the sinners and the tax collectors. But you remember who was getting on them about it. It was the Pharisees. They didn't even want him to heal anyone on the Sabbath. Keep walking with me. Beloved, Paul urges the believers, because he's the author of the book of Corinthians. He urges the, uh, the believers not to be yoked together with unbelievers, meaning that he was talking to the Corinthian church, but it applies to us in this generation. He is warning the Corinthians against forming binding partnerships or relationships with unbelievers. Because this might weaken uh -huh, their Christian commitment, integrity, and standards. So, 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 so Paul is saying, how can they walk together? I'll be, he said, don't be in a binding relationship. Talking about in the natural and in the business sense. Because he said it would be like a mismatch. It would be a mismatch. In other words, believers and unbelievers are opposites, just as light and darkness are opposites. They simply have nothing in common, just as Christ has nothing in common with Satan. Woo, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15 is evident of this, and it, it puts it like this. It said, what harmony can there be between Christ and Baal, meaning Satan? 
Or what does a, a, a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Mm. See, you know, some of them, uh, 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 th them unbelievers that hang around the church are uh, associated because they want to hear the word, but they, they, they far from God. Their heart is far from God. And they come around trying to make you think that they with you. Hallelujah. But as soon as you turn your back, they run in their mouth about you. But see, they don't realize that old girl, hallelujah, by the name of Charlene Keat, with the calling of pastor, hallelujah, has the spirit of discernment. But God is a God of love, hallelujah. And, and, and so I just keep on trying to demonstrate that love. And I'm going to keep on demonstrating. But sometimes we have to correct people. So yeah, God has given me the discernment. And they, some people come around, hallelujah, thinking you don't know. <laughs> but you know that old Satan, he can't hide but so long. If someone agree with me, type amen or say amen, hallelujah. So here Paul uses it to refer to Satan. The idea is that the pagan, wicked, unbelieving world is governed by the uh, principles of Satan and that Christians should be separate from that wicked world. Yeah, this world, <laughs> who you think is guided by? This is what, what Paul is telling us. He said that uh, the, the, the world, the unbelieving world is governed by the principles of Satan. And that Christian should be separate from that their, that wicked world, just as Christ was separate from all the methods, purposes, and plans of Satan. Beloved, he had no participation in them. He formed no union with them. Mm -hmm. He didn't form any union with the unbelieving, with the uh, union of, uh, of unbelievers. Hallelujah. Oh, God. In other words, in other words, uh, uh, attempting to live a Christian life with a non-Christian for our for a close friendship and our partner uh -huh, will only cause us to go around in circles. Oh, God. Sisters and brothers, the unequal yoke is often applied to business relationships. Keep walking with me for a Christian to enter in a, a, a partnership with an unbeliever is, is to court a disaster. You know, when a person's courting, you know, when a man is courting a woman, you're going to see all the good. No offense, men. <laughs> you It's the same with the walk, women. You're going to see all the good, but you got to hang around a little while. <laughs> But in this context, it's not talking about that. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. So Christians to enter in a partnership with an unbeliever is to court a, a, a disaster because unbelievers have opposite worldviews and morals. Uh huh. And business decisions made daily uh, made daily will reflect the worldview of one partner or the other. Uh mm huh. -hmm. We have different beliefs. Because one is saved and one is unsaved. For the relationship to work, beloved, one or the other must abandon his moral center and move towards that of the other. And more often than not, hallelujah, it is the believer who finds himself pressured to leave, to leave his Christian principles behind for the sake of profit and the growth of the business. On the other hand, on the other hand, the closest alliance one person can have with another is found in marriage. That's the closest. Because the Bible said the two shall become one, flesh. And this is how the passage is usually interpreted. When you talk about being unequally yoked, it's usually interpreted for a marriage, but it can be a business relationship as well, as well. My sisters and brothers, God's plan is for a man and a woman to become one flesh. 
Genesis 2, verse 24. You can go back and read that if you desire. A relationship so intimate that one literally and figuratively, figuratively becomes part of the other. When they become one, when they consummate the marriage. Uniting a believer with an unbeliever is essentially uniting opposites, which makes for a very difficult marriage relationship. On the other hand, on the other hand, Paul talks about uh, this earlier in 1 Corinthians. We in 2 Corinthians right now, but this is what he says earlier in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9 through 10. He says here, he says here uh, that this does not mean that we should isolate ourselves from unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 5 uh, uh, 9 through 10 puts it like this. It said, I wrote you in one previous letter. This is Paul talking. And he wrote the Corinthian church not to associate with, with sexually immoral people, not meaning the immoral people of this world or the greedy ones and swindlers or idolaters. For then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether. He said, you might as well get out of the world. He said, I'm not saying that. Verse 9 said this, Paul is referring, this is what he meant in 9, verse 9, to an earlier letter to the Corinthian church, often called the lost letter because it has not been preserved. Verse 10 said, Paul makes it clear that we should not disassociate ourselves from unbelievers. Otherwise, we could not carry out Jesus's command to tell them about salvation. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Welcome, Evan. Evelyn, thank you for being on this morning. I hope you're doing well. Our uh, foundational scripture is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 14. That's our foundation scripture. But Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 is evident of this, that we are not to disassociate ourselves with unbelievers. Otherwise, we would not carry out Jesus' command to tell them about salvation. So Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 says this. It says, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He said, this is what he's telling them. Jesus is telling them. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. He said, God, my God, my father has given me all authority, all power, absolute rule in heaven and on, and, and on earth. He's talking to the disciples. And he said, this is what I need you to do. He said, uh, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, helping the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. That's my heart's desire to help us to believe in our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. He left this over 2,000 years ago. He told his disciples to do this. And I tell you, I have a desire to do, to wish that just like Jesus, to wish that none should perish, that all shall have eternal life. So he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, helping the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. He said, and lo, I am with you always. So matter what, beloved, just know, Sister Patricia, that also Jesus came by and she, he touched your aunt and he said, it's time for you to come with me. And we go, you're going to miss her. Hallelujah. But the Bible said, here in Matthew, he said, Lo, I am with you always. Remain 
with you perpetually. Jesus Christ is with you and your family always in this situation, hallelujah, regardless of circumstances and on every occasion and even to the end of the age. So no matter what we go through, no matter what we have experienced, hallelujah, when Pastor Dicker lost his son, Hallelujah. It was painful. Hallelujah. When my son had to go away, it was painful. When Sister Evelyn lost her nephew, he had, he, hallelujah. It had, it was challenging for us. But I come by to encourage you this morning that here in Matthew 28, hallelujah, he said, Lo, I will be with you always. Yeah, we in 28, uh, verse 20. He said, T, we, it's my job because he called me. He teaches what he said, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And he said, Lo, I am with you always. He is with us. So we, he knows before us. He knows all things. He loves us. He's right there with us in the midst. We just got to take hold of it and don't play with this thing. Get committed to God. Connect to him because we keep on playing. Hallelujah. We go out there. He not might not allow us to make it back again. So we got to get on board. And when he allow us to come back to him, if we get away and we come back and repent, we should be to be determined to hold on to God's unchanging hand because he didn't have to protect your life. He didn't have to spare you. He knows every strand of hair on your head. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. He said, no, I will be with you always. Always. So beloved, the father gave Jesus authority, as I said. And on earth, mm. who God, thank you, Lord. On the basis of that authority, Jesus told his disciples to make more disciples that they preached, baptized, and taught. With this same authority, Jesus still commands us to tell others the good news and make them disciples for the kingdom. So this is evident that we should not disassociate with unbelievers. However, God is a balanced God. However, beloved, who God, we are to distance ourselves from those who claim, this is what I was saying earlier, who claim to be Christians, yet deliberately mm -hmm, indulge in sins explicitly forbidden in scripture and then rationalize their actions. Well, you know, I'm a woman. Oh, I'm a man. I got, I got needs. God said he's a keeper. Now don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I haven't dotted every eye. I haven't crossed every T. But I tell you, like I said, thank God that he didn't destroy you when you went out there to go and do your thing. So get connected. I can honestly say I'm connected to God. And if you got any doubt, Go to the Father about me. Do I get tested just like you? Yes. Hallelujah. And tempted because God, Jesus, I mean, not Jesus, Satan, he knows what we like. Keep it real. This pastor right here is going to keep it real with you. But God is the keeper if we want to be kept. Beloved, what we must realize that making excuses for sin harms others for whom Christ died and dims the image of God and those who do. You know, uh, I, unfortunately, I pray for my brothers and sisters that have fallen in, that you know, in the mega churches. I pray for them. I don't talk about them because, you know, things be coming at you when you up here. You, you tell, I'm telling you. With women and men. Mm. 
So we have to pray for one another. Paul explains that a church that willingly in includes such people is hardly fit to the light of the world. So I'm going to tell you something. God is a God of love, but he, it comes a time he's a God of judgment. That's why we can't play around with this thing. He said he will warn us. He will warn us before destruction. So he warned everybody before they, he just exposed them. That's, a, that's what he's saying here. Paul is, so Paul explains that a church that willingly includes such people and is hardly fit to the light of the world. This is Paul. He's the author of Corinthians. Paul says to do so would distort the picture of Christ and it presents to the world. Church leaders must be ready to correct in love for the sake of spiritual unity and of living out an effective witness for the gospel. Church leaders, but if the leaders having a problem, God, believe me, God is dealing with us about certain things. And he said he will warn us all before the destruction. In addition, in addition, 1 Corinthians, if you would like to turn there, 7, 1 Corinthians 7, Chapter 7, verse 12 through 13. Paul even urges Christians to stay with their unbelieving spouses. He said, Paul doing a lot this morning. If you are already married and you done married an unbeliever and he, really, he wants to stay with you, that's what he's talking about, uh, he or she. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 7, starting at verse 12. To the rest, I, to the rest meaning the rest of the people, I, des I declare... I not the Lord, since Jesus did not discuss this. This is what he's saying. <laughs> that if any believing brother has a wife who does not believe in Christ and she consents to live with him. See, see, people, let me stop for a minute. Now, Paul made it very clear. He said in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12 through 13. He said, Paul urges Christians to stay with their, Paul urges Christians to stay with their unbelieving spouses. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12 through 13. And this is what he said. He said, to the rest, he said, I declare. He said, I, not the Lord. So people take things out of context sometimes. He said, I, not the Lord. Since Jesus did not discuss this. So that's Paul. He said that if any believing brother has a wife, Paul is saying it. Does uh, uh, have a, has a wife who does not believe in Christ and she consents to live with him, he must not leave her. And if any believing woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not leave him. Beloved, because of their of their desire to serve Christ, some people in the Corinthian church thought they ought to divorce their pagan spouses and marry Christians. Mm. But Paul affirmed the marriage commitment. God's idea is for a husband and wife. So he was telling the Corinthian church this. He said, Jesus didn't say anything about this, but he said, you already married to him. And they, they, they all right with you being a Christian. They all right with you going to church and they're not, uh, uh, trying to come against the Christian faith. Just, you know, stay with them. Let's keep, let's keep reading what the stu study Bible said. It said, but, but, but Paul <coughs> affirmed the marriage commitment. God's idea is for a husband and wife to stay together, even when one of them is not a believer. The Christian spouse should try to win the other to Christ. It would be easy to rationalize leaving. He said it'd be easy to rationalize leaving. Well, you know, I thought he, you know, he was a Christian. He told me, but you're a Christian. You rooted and grounded in the word. Let me, let me not touch it. Say, Pastor, you already have. So the Christian spouse should try to win the other to Christ. It would be easy. See, I've been there. Now let, we, let's don't even, you know, I've been there. I've done it. I'm, I, I'm really, I'm pointing at me. I'm talking. <laughs> I've done that. 
It would be easy to rationalize leaving. However, Paul makes a strong, strong case for staying with an unbelieving spouse and being a positive influence on one's marriage. Paul, like Jesus, believed in the permanence of marriage. And that's found in Mark 10, verse 1 through 9. What this passage is saying here is that Paul wanted believers to be active in their witness for Christ who, um, to unbelievers. But he did not want them to lock themselves into personal or business relationships that could cause them to compromise their faith. My sisters and brothers, uh, as believers, they and us, the Corinthian church, should do everything in our power to avoid situations that could force us to divide our loyalties. And we can tell if we have gone too far by asking which partner influenced the other the most. Paul makes us aware that these verses apply to marriage as well as other relationships. Paul did not want believers to enter into marriage with unbelievers because the relationship lacked unity and in the most important issue of life, commitment and obedience to God. And because a marriage involves two people becoming one. Faith, their faith will become an issue and one spouse may have to compromise their belief for the sake of the unity. Keep walking with me. My sisters and brothers, if some are honest, uh -huh, if some of us are honest, many people discount this problem only to regret it later. I told you, been there. You regret it later. Paul is telling the church of Corinth and us, hallelujah, to not allow emotion, uh-huh, and pay them emotions go change every time. It changes <laughs> sometimes with the wind, with emotion and passion to blind us with someone who will not be your spiritual partner. Sisters and brothers, once we have discovered God's light, we should not compromise with those who can't see. Once we have discovered God's light. We should not compromise with, with those who can't see. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20 through 21 puts it like this. He said, on the contrary, the things which the Gentiles, meaning pagans, he called the Gentiles pagans, sacrifice. They sacrifice to demons in effect and not to God. And do not want you to become partners with demons by eating at feasts in pagan temples. You, verse 21, you cannot drink both the Lord's cup and the cup of demons. You cannot share in both the Lord's table and the table of demons, thereby becoming partners with them. He said, remember, those who have discovered God's light should not compromise with those who cannot see. So what Paul is saying here in this passage, beloved, 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21, is that as following Christ, we must give our, our, our total allegiance to him. We cannot, as Paul explains, have a part in the cup of the Lord and a cup and the cup of demons, eating at the Lord's table, meaning communing with Christ and identifying with him in his death. We can't do both. He said drinking from a cup of demons means identifying with Satan by worshiping and promoting pagan or evil activities. Uh-huh. We must ask ourselves, you know, when Paul was talking about this promoting pagan or evil activity, you know, it might be something not godly or moral that you that you enjoy, your flesh enjoy, my flesh enjoy, that we used to do. We're saved. But we haven't forgotten. And we and this familiar spirit comes around, you know, you know that man that that style that you like in a man, and you be like, Good Lord. Woo! And you remember it, but you say now, Paul, I'm telling you now, it's something. This word is something. He said, We <laughs> He said, we can't be drinking from the cup of demons anymore because we're serving God. And we're not talking about them. We want them to get saved. I just told you what Paul was saying. He said, it'll be, we can't disassociate ourselves with unbelievers. 
But you know you're attracted to that man. You know he ain't on the road to, 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 to knowing God. But it's something about his swag. You remember when you was out there. And you say, Lord. So you're looking there and you're saying, Lord, help me. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. We must ask ourselves, beloved, am I leading two lives? Trying to follow both Christ and the crowd. The Bible says that you can do both at the same time. That's exactly what I'm talking about. If you agree with me, say amen. We can't do both at the same time. So Paul was telling the Corinthian church to be careful about forming, binding partnerships and our relationships with unbelievers. He continues by saying in 1 John 2, verse 15 through 16, and he's even talking about the world. We got to be mindful. We have to be the light. I told the people at the women's empowerment yesterday, when you walk in the room, they say, whoa, it's something different about her because her thing was the, uh, being, um, unfiltered, unveiled. And you know, we take off the veil, hallelujah, because in Paul, we, I, I, I used the book of Exodus where, uh, Moses was, went up on the Mount Sinai and he was in the face of God. And I told him, and then when he came back, down the radiance that was on him because anytime we get in the face of God, we it's a radiance about us. Hallelujah. And you can tell that that person has spent time with God. And when you step in a room, they be like, what in the world? Cause you didn't spend time with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's a radiance. It's a light that shines from you. They say, God, what is it different about her? She's so full of joy and jolly and happy. Jesus. So Paul is telling the Corinthian church to be careful about forming binding partnerships and, and our relationship with unbelievers. First John 2 verse 15, 16 says, it, says this, do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16 goes on to tell us what it looks like when someone loved the world. We talk about being unequally yoked. You could be unequally yoked with God. See, we always think it's just a marriage, but being unequally loved in, in uh, love with, you know, when I was talking about the business relationship and one, you going in partnership with an unbeliever, and one, the one, the unbeliever want to do something that's not moral, but the believer want to do what's right. This is what unequally yoked is talking about. They're not equally yoked. And then it also applies in a relationship. But I told you that God is a balanced God. So, you know, he don't want us to be unequally yoked because it will cause, you know, imbalance and sometimes confusion in a relationship. And God is concerned about us because we are emotional creatures. That's the part of our soul, emotions. But we can't allow our emotions to lead and guide us. God's word should lead and guide us, and he helps us to be balanced. But Paul goes on to say that we can't be in love with the world either because it'll be unequally yoked with the Lord. He, verse 16 goes on to tell us, it said, it looks like when someone loved the world more than the father. And this is what he says. He said, for all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh. Just like I was gave the man example. And, uh, and the lust and longing of the eyes and the uh, boastful pride of life, meaning joy, confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things. You know, a person who making good money. And they just want to show everything off. Hey, baby, you need some money. Pull out water money. Just want to show everything. Just in love with money. And then, you know that saying, keeping up with the Joneses? Paul is talking about this. In love with the world. He said we can't. He said meaning showing confidence in one's resources are in, stability, in the stability of earthly things. Because see, those things can pass away. I told you. I was making real good money in Charlotte in my profession, but then my health got attacked and it stopped my business, had my own business and working, making good money, nice house. But then when my health was attacked, oh, Jesus, 
So we can't get, we can't get unequally yoked with the father and, and, and be so showy. This is what Paul was saying. Though these do not come from the Father, but are the from, are from the world. That's what he said. Beloved, some people think that worldliness only has to do with external behavior. Meaning the people with, we associate with, the places we go and the activities we enjoy. And let me stop again. When I was making that money and doing very well in the natural. And did not have, didn't even believe there was a God. Hallelujah. I would say, this is what I would say. I would say, what's wrong with them people? Talking about my tooth, what's wrong with them? Giving their money to that church. And God got a hold of me. And now I'm the first sister to, to get up here and preach the word of God where my other sister, she started. But they both say, and I'm saying this. Because of my experience with a religious pastor at the age of 12 years old. And I said, I never get saved. I never be involved in a church because they all hypocrites. The only thing I can do is uh, uh, expose them. That was my mentality on my high horse, new car. New house, doing well, and then my body, hallelujah. God has a way that's mighty sweet. He can take everything. So I'd rather be with God than without God. And that's not the reason I came to Christ. He got my attention, hallelujah. And I began to, I was working at Bennett College for women where I was going to college. And I was always listening to the word of God and a, a, a Christian music because I knew it was something right about it. Hallelujah. And, but I didn't, I had one foot in and one foot out because I didn't trust, hallelujah. And then I heard a pastor by the name of Pastor uh, Michael Thomas talking about the people that have fleed the sheep, meaning taken, taken from them and have uh, 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 done uh, evil towards them. They're going to have to pay for it. I said, oh, this man is talking my language now. See, that was my mindset. Getting back. It didn't have anything to do with love. But that's what drew me to the church. And I served there for many years. And I began to travel. And then God, and then I said, God, if you're real, help me. Help my unbelief. Not knowing that's in the word. Because I'm tired, Lord, looking at all these religious folks in my family say one thing and do another. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I, and being abused by a pastor. See, that's why we can't put pastors and leaders on a pedestal. That's why I always say build a relationship with God. Get to know him. Then when you go to the service, you add to the church. You add to it because you know how good he is. And he can provide. He is your provider. And you can say that with confidence. And I don't wish that anyone go through what I've gone through with my health, with my finances. But God, he's a God of restoration because he has restored my life totally. And the best is yet to come. It's amazing. He had given me all these things, the, the, the uh, visions, and he didn't let anything come forth because he knew that I was going to have to go through this surgery with the brain. But I'm here talking to you because I didn't know if I would be able to. Never been sick. Never been in the hospital. But to have my child and God, he allowed me to come back. And Sister Evelyn called me during that time. And it really bothered her. I don't understand. You serving God. I I, I was like, I, didn't, I don't either, Sister. But... You know, God is, 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 he's great. He's no respect of person. He's no respect of person. So Paul, 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 I tell you, God is good. I wasn't expecting to go there. 
So some people think that worldliness only has to do with external behavior, meaning the people we associate with, with, the places we go, the activities we enjoy. But worldliness affects us internally because it begins in the heart and is characterized by three attitudes. Mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. This is the three uh, characteristics of uh, uh, worldliness. And he said, this is, it begins in the heart. Number one, the first characteristic, the, work, the attitude, the lust of the flesh, meaning preoccupation with gratifying physical desires. Gratifying. I got to have that. Boy, he looks good. For the men, boy, she look good. I got to have that. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. Meaning accumulating of things, as I was saying, and bowing to the God of materialism. And number three, let me repeat, re repeat them. Some people might be writing it down. Number one, it's, you know, the, the, Worldliness affects us et eternally because it begins in the heart and is char characterized by three attitudes. And the three attitudes, number one, the lust of the flesh, meaning preoccupation, preoccupation with gratif gratifying physical desires. Number two, the lust of the eyes. The accumulation, the accumulation of things, bowing to God, of the God of materialism. And number three, the pride of life, obsession with our status or importance. You know, I am the president of B, B and T or what, whatever, you know, just prideful of life, the pride of life, obsession with our status are importance of importance. You see, beloved, when the serpent tempted Eve in Genesis 3, verse 5, he tempted her with these three areas. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, these were also his uh, three areas of attack. And this is found in Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11. My sisters and brothers, by contrast, God loves self-control, generosity, and commitment to humble service. It is possible to give the impression of avoiding worldly pleasures while still harboring worldly desires in one's heart. But like Jesus, we should love sinners and spend time with them while closely adhering uh, to the values of God's kingdom. We, we should be telling them about the about Jesus, about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if we're not telling them, we should be that person that takes the veil off and they say, what is it different about you? And the only way we can do that is spend time with God, building a relationship with him, studying the word of God. Study to show thyself approved, but workmen needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Beloved, if you have failed in the past, ask yourself, what values are more important to you? Mm -hmm. What values are more important to you? And do your actions reflect the world's values or God's values? I pray, beloved, that you can say, that your values reflects God's values. But if you need Jesus today, you need to make him savior of your life and Lord of your life. You can do it this morning. As I previously stated, we he gives us time and time over and over again. And we made it back. And we're so grateful to God because we could have died out there. We can't allow our flesh or get caught up in the world to lead and guide us. When we get connected to the lifeline, this is pastor's uh, way of saying it, get connected to the lifeline, which is the word of God, Jesus Christ. We can do anything. Philippians 4 verse 13 said we can do anything through Christ 
who strengthens us. But we have to get connected to a Bible believing teaching ministry and grow in the, in the Lord and begin to pray, Lord, what is my purpose in life? Why was I born? Although I feel unloved sometimes, I know you a love, you a God of love. So connect me to the right ministry and teach me your love, God, and help me to love others. I know how it is to struggle with loving someone because they hurt you. But God, if you he's the vine, we're the branches. Think of a plant. If it's not connected to the soil and water, it'll die. Spiritually, we the same with us. God is a simplistic God. Some people, some pastors make it difficult. But this one is very simple and very real. Amen. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you don't know him today. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you don't know him, if you don't know him, just, just get quiet and just examine your heart. If you don't know him, Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, repeat after me. If you don't know him, say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. After listening to this message, I realize that I'm unequally yoked because I'm not yoked to you, Lord. I believe by faith and I confess, I confess that you sent your only begotten son, God, to die on the cross for me. But on the third day, he rose again. I confess that and I believe it by faith. I've never seen it, but I believe it by faith in Jesus name. Next, I want to encourage you to get connected to a Bible-believing ministry. And if you're not, continue to listen to us and grow in the things of God. If it's God's will for me to get back in the building, it takes money and it takes people. It takes us, be, you know, as a you being unified to get back in that building. We will and we will fellowship and you will grow and you will know your purpose. You will begin to know. Not because what pastor says. It's because you're learning the word of God. And you're praying during your devotional time. Along with him. And then you come to me. As the shepherd. And say pastor I believe God is. And I say you know what. Because a shepherd. He, he, he prays for his sheep. He prays for them. And to everyone on here. I'll be praying for. Because I go back and I look. And ask God to strengthen you and to help you. So I pray that whoever's out there, I pray that you accepted Christ today as Savior. And you're on the road to making him Lord over your life in Jesus' name. And the Bible said that the angels of the Lord rejoice. And guess what? I rejoice with, with them that another soul was saved and on their way to heaven. If you don't know him, I mean, if you have known him and you've allowed the pressures of this life and you got away from God, Acts 3 verse 19, it says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And he promised that a time of refreshing would come from the Lord. Repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus. I repent for my sins. I make a conscious decision today to walk away from that thing or that, that, that person that I've allowed me, allowed to take me away from you, God. Help me, Father. Help me in my weakness. Lead and guide me to the church that you will have me where I can grow and learn of you. I need you, Father. I know I can't make it without you. This thing is so uh, gratifying to my flesh. And I know I'm unequally yoked because I'm not yoked to you, Father. Help me in my weakness. But thank you, God, for giving me a time of refreshing today. If you are crying right now, you're releasing those tears. 
that pressure. God knows that you needed a time of refreshing. He said, it's like sitting on a beach with no shelter and a cool breeze, breeze come back by. It's refreshing you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Welcome. Welcome back into the family of God. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Charlene Sparks, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Good to see you. Sorry for your loss, your cousin, uh, Sister um, Netta. Lord's will. I'm going to go by the um, Hoggets and see her body if I'm not able to make it uh, to the church. Love and faith. And there was, I have seen her and talked to her occasionally, but um, that was uh, really a shock, which I know we all will be leave here one day. But thank you for tuning in to today, my sister. Evelyn Wallington, thank you. Thank you so much. Pastor Dicker, thank you. To God be the glory. Sister Waters, uh, if I didn't call your name, thank you. Thank you. So it's so many of you. Uh, Theodore Washington, thank you guys for uh, turning, uh, tuning in. I believe I missed another man that I saw on. Kevin Johnson, thank you. Gina Asley, hi. How you doing down there in Cole? I think it's Colfax. Thank you for tuning in, Taylor Hamlet. I see all those posts. Gerald Smith, thank you, uh, Gerald, for watching uh, this morning. We give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because he's worthy. Amen. We will be back here. I am back for the ones that are here consistently on Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. I will be back studying the word of God with you. We will be picking back up in the book of March. We've been studying the four gospels. And I am looking forward to studying the word of God. Um, we are back. We've been off for a couple of weeks and, and we will be back, starting back up this Tuesday at 730. You all have a blessed rest of the week. May God be with you and may heaven smile on you. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for another opportunity to study your word with your people. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise for those who have accepted Christ today and those who have come back to you, Father. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, because we know that whatever we go through, will you tell us in Mark, Matthew 28, he said, you said, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of, earth, of the earth. Lord, I ask you to continue to look over the Welch family, Patricia Welch's family, as they lost their aunt this morning. Continue to look over Sister Nana's family as she had, you took her own home, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Continue to look over to Maris and Damaris in the name of Jesus and all the ones under the sound of my voice, Evelyn, hallelujah, and Sister Gina and Brother Gerald and uh, 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 Pastor Dicker and all Evelyn, why all of them look over and protect them. Let no hurt, harm, or danger come to them. Let the angel of the Lord to continue to be around them, protecting them, leading and guiding them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, the name that's above every name. He said in his word that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You have a wonderful rest of the week until Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. Have a blessed rest of the week. And thank you for tuning in.